Highway System Roberta checking the construction alert. Not only do we have Nine Mile back open in Hazel Park, but we're about to see some improvement on Eight Mile on the Detroit Southfield border as crews are close to wrapping up that bridge project. The way I remember General Motors going bankrupt, I remember the feeling not being surprised at all. For us, it was, you know, like a day like any other day. People getting up, going to work. It wasn't a day like shocking news. It was more like the inevitable death of a very old member of the family. I felt like, okay, now we can move on. A Jew and Roberta, a company called Beijing Auto in China, has reached a deal this morning to acquire certain assets of GM's Saab unit. And also today... It, it's it's, it's almost bigger than life. It's the rock of Gibraltar. It can't go bankrupt. It was almost like hearing that uh, your child and your parent that you depend upon for your existence is on life support. Friday's high holding to about 30 degrees, 34 is Detroit's current reading. It was kind of a sad day. We were just all in disbelief and in awe that it actually happened. When you have, when you're supposed to have some of the smartest guys in charge of things and they say bankruptcy is the way to go, I guess you, all you have is the hope that they know what they're talking about and that you emerge from that and become a better company. They're the type of company that's always said, oh, we'll just make what the people want. But obviously that's not what they were doing. The bankruptcy of GM was kind of, you know, it, it's not really a popular thing to say around Detroit, but um, I was actually pretty excited because I thought for once, uh, maybe this big company had a chance to change. This was, this was like where I played. I remember, you know, playing with my little trucks on this, on this uh, porch railing. I remember seeing, you know, in the afternoon, the school kids coming and going, and then at a different time in the afternoon, watching the factory workers walk to work. Uh, many people just walked, you know, and here in America now, everybody drives, people drive to the end of their driveway to pick up their mail, uh, but, but then, it was a different kind of a community. It was a great neighborhood, really. Um, most of the people who lived here worked for General Motors. The Buick factory was just, just a few blo uh, blocks that way. So it was a working class neighborhood. It wasn't a poor neighborhood. Most of the people that worked in the automobile factories did really well. Um, nobody realized how fragile that economy was because it was always there. Uh, General Motors was actually born here in Flint, so it grew up here. But pe people who worked in the factories, especially in the, after the 1940s, made very good wages, um, more than a college graduate would make. This is our tiny little kitchen. This house, like thousands of others, um, was abandoned. And when people leave, they don't take their houses with them. And they also don't pay taxes anymore on the property. And so my office uh, is responsible for tax collection. And when people abandon their property and stop paying taxes, we take that to court we get a judgment and take ownership of the property. So this house now is owned by the land bank. 
we get those properties and then we try to make a decision about what to do with them, with, with all these thousands of abandoned houses. That brings back a lot of memories because I have not heard that bell ring uh, in a really long time. Hmm. It's funny because the, the sounds that I remember, I remember the church bell ringing and then I remember the factory whistle ringing. You know, the factory whistle saying it's time for the shift to start. Of course, we don't hear that anymore, but uh, it's interesting. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Turn that down. I think so. Yeah. You know, this is the house I lived in when I was a little boy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. Well, welcome back from years. Yeah, then, exactly. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> and I'm on that camera. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> this was a city of about 190,000 people, and we had 80,000 people working for General Motors. So the odds are, if you had a job in Flint, it was a job working for General Motors. Or a job that depended on General Motors. Sounds like it's raining. Now, I mean, the, the problem we have is that the legacy of General Motors is what I'm left with. I deal with empty houses where GM workers used to live, with empty buildings where General Motors used to have factories, with wide open space that used to be a, um, a factory and it's now an empty you know, piece of abandoned property that we now own. There's an office building that was once a General Motors office building that, that my land bank now owns. So. In many ways, we're left, I'm left, dealing with the cleanup of this mess. Well, these are all mine. I, I own all, they're all Chevys. Each one has a different role, I guess, in our lives. As you see here, we have a dump truck that we use in our business to deliver uh, different things, trees and stone and mulch and things. Over here, we have the box van, which if we want to move things around, not get it wet, you can put things inside. Plus, we hook the mud truck, which is the black truck up over there, to go to the mud bogs, and then we haul that. The black truck here is hooked to the trailer. We move our equipment around with that, the skid steer that sets over there, and the excavator. The one next to the black truck over there is the white blazer. And what we do with that is we go to the sand dunes to play in the sand. One for the mud, one for the sand. Uh, black truck here is for, got a plow on in front of it to plow around here in the farm, keep the roads open and stuff. The red one I drive to work in the wintertime, which also has a plow on it. The white one I drive in the summertime, it gets better gas mileage, it has a six cylinder in it. And this is my wife's car.
General Motors have been number one forever. They've been the ones to beat forever. You want to talk about a sad day? A sad day is when Toyota announced that they their sales were more than what GM is. You know, that's probably a day that sticks with me more than the bankruptcy day. I'm the president of UAW Local 652, which stands for the United Auto Workers Union. And what I do is I'm in charge of the administration of the hall of our membership and deal with any problems that might become before the membership. Joel, Mike Green, I am good. I guess we're in the business of selling Cadillacs. All right, I think they got them in stock. Years ago, you didn't have to worry about market share because, or, or you know, it was just a given that people bought because that's what their dad drove or, you know, you, this is what you buy. And then slowly, you know, by not paying attention and there's other things on the market and you don't have the loyalties that you used to have of, you know, of people just buying because that's what you bought. You know, somehow it got to be uncool to drive a domestic vehicle. I try not to be a negative person. You know, I try to look at what we need to do right. And I think they're putting some people in place where they're going to right some wrongs, and I think they're going to, you know, straighten up, and maybe fly right. I mean, I, and I think they owe that to the people. They owe that to themselves. It's too good of a company to, to see that disappear, you know, from the landscape of the of the nation. GM donated this building to CCS to use. It's kind of turned into this epicenter of design in Detroit with the college that I attend. Just down the hall is the clay studio, the computer labs, everything is just kind of right in these halls where so many infamous and um, iconic designs were presented right in this very room. I guess what makes me different from many of my other uh, colleagues and students is that I focus mainly on sustainable transportation and solutions for the environmental problems that we have today. Coming from car design in a more sustainable way and looking for solutions to the problems, it's just, it's just crazy that now we're in this space where so many of those problems were helped to create. I think General Motors at one time represented kind of the pinnacle of the industrial era. How a company could become so dominant in a market just through sheer brute force. General Motors simply became too large for their own good. They had so many brands that they couldn't even keep up with. They just basically became a dinosaur. I guess it's just almost fitting that the solutions are going to come from the same place that generated the problems. And hopefully, you know, myself and the people at this school can do our best to find those solutions. The uh, Fisher body plant where pretty much all cars were built from GM um, before they had their own design. All the design work and all the body work was done by Fisher. To me, it, it just represents the glory days of Detroit and it's just so strange to see, to see this site and, and just the environment around it is just so peculiar. Mm -hmm. Detroit used to be a very diverse city. People lived downtown, people walked, people took the tram. In a sense, it was 
one of the most European cities in its design. Densely populated, easy to get about, and it had a very, very good public transportation system. Grand Central, or Grand Station, um, was essentially the hub of that. Um, the epicenter of, of the trains and the trams that ran all around the city. Um, so, when the automobile basically came to be, General Motors saw the trolleys and the public transportation as competition for their new product. And in order to eliminate it, basically bought up that industry and saw too that it was not going to be around. So the people in Detroit were basically forced into the automobile. situation tell us the next round of layoffs could come this month. GM said it would cut 10,000 of its 73,000 salary positions. Despite the heavy losses, GM says it has ample liquidity. The early 60s, 62, 3, 4, 5, 6, those were what I call the innocent years. Uh, you know, people began to make good money. Uh, things began to turn around here for African Americans. And uh, we as kids began to experience a better life than our parents did. You had people migrating up here from the South and with very little education get hired in right away at the plant. You know, people were coming up here by the bus loads, you know, and uh, it really built the middle class in Southeast Michigan. So now that you see that that lifeline is not gone, but it has changed drastically. I want to be successful spiritually. I want to be successful naturally. I want to be successful financially. I want to be successful mentally. Come on, somebody. Because what good is all What helps me to help people in making wise decisions on stewardship? I have a discipline in finances, uh, specifically the area of accounting. Stuff that just makes you know, you're like, why you rap that? <laughs> come on, come on, son. Why are you rapping no cookies? <laughs> God has me here for such a time as this. Uh, it is no coincidence that Greater Grace Temple has a pastor who happens to be an accountant. Somebody say good stewardship. Good stewardship. Somebody say godly stewardship. Godly stewardship. We're in a financial climate and a financial time where we have got to put some principles in place and get ourselves together. Because regardless of where the economy goes, regardless of what the economy does, God still holds us accountable and responsible. I'm trying to be as long as about three weeks. You know, me and looking for an apartment. I found an apartment, found a place, 500 a month. Um, I know I can afford it. It's just that I was coming to you for um, help with my with my first month's rent and everything right. like that, if it's possible. All right. Anybody can find an apartment. But keep because, it as a thing. Because there ain't nothing but vacant apartments out here. You can look across the street, they got a sign up. Motivating people in this day and time is more difficult than it was in my father's pastorate. When people were laid off uh, during those decades, you knew uh, when you would be returning to work. So my father's days of motivating was, I think, a little easier than my day. They come to me and say, Bishop, what am I going to do? And uh, I can't say, well, in six months, things will be better. I don't know. So we have to exercise a greater faith in God
Lord, we thank you for this day and for this time and season, these two that you've brought together in love and in unity. We pray that as they move toward the day of nuptials, that you will continue to be more close to you. Communities all across this country don't know it, but they're one decision away from being the next Flint, Michigan. I think the cities in America that are willing to rebuild themselves and not simply pretend that we are the city that we used to be, ironically, are the cities that are going to be best positioned for growth in the future. Now it's a city that is built for twice the number of people that we actually have. So I think the kind of successful city that Flint can be is gonna is going to require that it become cleaner, smaller, uh, more sustainable, but that it also not ever you know, ever again become dependent on one company. We've got thousands of abandoned houses. We've got more houses than we have people. So rather than simply selling those properties off to speculators, that's the whole idea is that we get the property into the hands of the land bank, turn to, turn to the neighborhood, and, you know. And that's where that's Harry's where work comes in. Phase one was we had gardens. This spring, uh, I'm going to go more to southern food because I went to the farmer's market this year and the first day there I had crowded peas, black eyed peas, purple hulls, and they sold out immediately. Did they really? I did not have enough. So I know that when we have young children, I had 10 children here, teens from 14, 21, teach them how to grow crop, how to become a business person, and how to understand how food grows and maybe interest them in agriculture. I mean, to me, it's the social connections that it creates. The neighborhood becomes a tighter unit. Yeah, you build a community around it, yeah. really. I mean, I know just from seeing the neighbors come out when we've been out here, a lot of times neighbors wouldn't come out and talk to one another, but you got this going on. It's, a, it's like a center for the neighborhood. to be able to do what and be what kind of person? This job, this person will be the chairman of the Genesee County Land Bank and will have to be responsible for its operations as well. So not just understanding the finance side of the work, but also understanding communities and how neighborhoods are stable and how they, how the, this whole process. I, I basically had three choices. One was to continue what I'm doing now, stay in the political world and be a local policy maker and then maybe you know, move on to some other office. The other choice was to go work for the new Obama administration. And I was very interested in that and spent a lot of time talking to the, to the people in the White House. And, you know, was almost ready to make that move, but really felt like this, this third option of running my own policy center was a better fit for me. I feel like I've known you 100 years. Michael said, tell Kathy and I, and I'll draw our picture this year, too. Not to scare you, uh, but there is a, a reality that foreclosure could occur. And right. I wouldn't expect this year, because we're pretty certain we've got things nailed out, but with a new incoming treasurer, the treasurer sets the policy. Yeah. Right. And In my new work, uh, starting the beginning of next year, I'll be the president of a, of a think tank, of a policy center. Uh, it'll be a national organization to support the same kind of policies that I've developed here in Michigan, and particularly in Flint. With Mr. Kildee, um, Dan always being so, uh, such a humanitarian, oh, very, absolutely. very socially conscious, right. I, I would hope the person that followed in his footsteps would have similar views. views yeah. Sometimes it comes right down to either we eat 
or we save money for property taxes and and you know it's I just have to hang on to my faith you know I'm a Christian so I hang on to my faith if it wasn't for that I wouldn't have got through February, and um, if she had made her payments, then we would Most of us, 40 her. years and older, have witnessed the transitions and the transformations of the automobile industry. We have seen the rise and, yes, the decline of what is known as the Big Three, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. We have celebrated bright days and endured dark hours over approximately 100 years of automobile history. However, we have never seen as midnight an hour as we face this coming week. As our national lawmakers on Capitol Hill contemplate whether or not they will extend the much needed financial assistance to these crucial American automobile manufacturers. For those of you who think that this is not a spiritual message, I ask you to ponder the history of our car manufacturers. First, let's understand that it is God that says if a man doesn't work, then he should not eat. It is God who ordained man to work by the sweat of his brow and it is God who demands that a man should be the head of his home in leadership in example and in provisions please hold it please stop please stop I'm going to take care of you. You hear what I'm saying? Look me in my eyes. I'm going to take care of you. Sweetheart, sweetheart, sweetheart. We're going to have plenty of coats. We got plenty of coats. We got plenty of coats, baby. Let's calm down. I need you to pop this one. Thank you so much. Come on, baby. All they had to do was get off their lazy behind and go down there and get a voucher. I've never seen these times before. Detroit and Southeast Michigan or Michigan as a whole, which was once viewed probably in the top five of, uh, of making a person financially independent. Now, you know, it, it's almost gone full circle. And now it is, you know, ranking in the top five of the poorest in the union. We're fortunate because they built two new plants in Lansing, but there's still been a lot of loss of jobs. You know, like when I hired in in 1978, we had 14,000 members at Local 652. Right now, we've got under 1,000 in GM right now that are permanent people. 13,000 people, that's how many manufacturing jobs have been lost. Normally, they would work today, but he took a week out of the schedule too many cars. They don't need, really need the cars, so instead of having a layoff, you take weeks out of your schedule, shut the plant down. Saying the government should cut off General Motors. That's right, no more bailout money, GM. I don't think the government should put any more money there until General Motors shows that they can be a viable company for the long term and that there's a reasonable chance that any loans that the government would make uh, would be paid back to the taxpayers. 
Anything short of that is just you know, we, we don't look at it as a bailout. You know, you're looking at, well, why should the taxpayers pay that? Well, here here's a perspective. We're all taxpayers. You guys are paying taxes, right? Now, now they're saying, well, you guys make good money. You know what happens when you make good money? You pay more taxes. You spend good money. You, take, you pay more taxes. But if you're making good money, th these are the middle class people attached right to Main Street that are spending the money that make the world go round. Okay. There's a People lot of things attached to it. Effect. They don't yeah. understand the trickle effect that this For has. Every it's person, not just automotive anymore. Right. Because, you know, these people come into town every day, so they're frequent stores, gas stations. You pick the things up. You know, most everybody that's here attached to manufacturing, I think, is nine job, nine people. But you nine and I come from the same small that. town. And right. people, people want to slam the GM in their hourly wages. When I tell you what, when the hour, people are out of work, right. that the towns suffer because we don't, they, right. it's a trickle effect. If you don't have the money, you're not earning the cops business. Right. They, they, they suffer. So it affects right. everybody. I have exactly. friends that are carpenters, rough carpenters, trimmers, and electricians, and they're they're the ones that suffer and because There's you and I, well, we are not, we're not building today. We're not, people are not spending money today because of the auto industry. That's why it's suffering. As it emerges from bankruptcy, the once mighty General Motors Corporation will become the smaller General Motors Company. Half its brands are being sold off or phased out, leaving only Chevy, Buick, GMC, and Cadillac. And the new GM reportedly is considering changing its logo background from blue to green to emphasize its commitment to smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. The United States I've seen them before they went bankrupt, and I've seen them after. And honestly, I don't see any change. Um, I see a lot of marketing, and I see a lot of hype, but I don't really see a whole lot of effort. In the 21st century, making a car that gets 20 miles per gallon just isn't acceptable. I've worked on projects with GM, and they might say one thing to you in the beginning. You know, they'll say, okay, do your research, come up with an idea. The bottom line is, they're not even going to listen to it. They don't consider ideas unless there's some hot sketch on the wall. And I think that's just completely backwards of how a car company should operate. They were so focused on just making one type of pickup truck, changing the headlights. You know, for them, changing the grill was a major revolution. For decades, while the Americans had their head in the sand. The rest of the world was being alert. I guess what what's kept Toyota and Honda and you know all these Japanese companies so far ahead of the US is just their incredible quality. They became so far ahead of the American competition that you know when these vehicles came into the US it was like, wow, look at this car, it's reliable, it's durable and you know, it uses half the gas of the truck that I'm using now. And if you look at an American truck, um, you know, for decades, they were using the same basic chassis that was developed you know, back in the 60s or 70s. I look at GM and I see kind of the past um, and that's what's hard for me about thinking about working for something like that. It's like why would I want to go into the past? You know, for me, I would want to work for the next GM, you know, a company that's rising from these ashes of, of bankruptcy and basically makes GM irrelevant. So is GM like hiring anyone after this stuff? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to go work there? Dude, I would. I'd be happy going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> At this point. Yeah. Anything's a job. Yeah. There's really no jobs being offered in the automotive design world, so it, it's really hard to say like, okay, General Motors comes to you today and offers you a job. Would you take it? But for me, I wouldn't. I don't think I could morally or ethically take that position.
they, they talk about General Motors being behind the times and stuff. You talk about flex fuel. They put all kinds of money in that research. You talk about clean energy. You talk about uh, battery. People don't want it. You know, it's easy when gas goes to 450 a gallon. They say, well, all you, you guys build the gas guzzlers. No, we build what people want. People want trucks. They want SUVs for the different things they're doing. I'm not going to be able to go out there and hook on to one of these small cars with that trailer because everything outweighs the car. It's a big SUV and the gas mileage isn't so much, but you want to be able to put half the soccer team in it and, and put your wife in it and not have to worry about it, you know, because you know you've bought the best. Hey, Connie, the pie balls are on the farm here. Yeah. I hope they come back. They were back here on the hill, but I think they're both uh, does or whatever, but if they, they come up here, I'm going to shoot one of them. Is Dad hunting? Depends on how the news media spins it, you know. Um, well, you're saying, well, they make too much money. Well, how do you know? You know, do you... Do you know what we do? I mean, I could pick out 10 or 15 different occupations that make twice as much money as we make an hour that are doing a lot less than we're doing. These people are physically working and doing things. Well, look here. This is something you're never going to see. It's a white deer. You're going you're gonna to want to see this. They're called pie balls. This is exciting. General Motors is if it's not relation to you, it might be your neighbor, or somebody you knew. So it's kind of a family run business. You know, myself, I'm third generation. My father was working there, and you have a lot of two, three, and four generation families that are there. My son's name is Rollin Green. When he got out of high school, he always wanted to follow in the footsteps of working at General Motors. In, in 08, he actually got hired as an entry level. He was laid off when, when the crunch started to hit. He was one of the first ones to go. I'm worried in the sense that he might have to leave the state to get work, and that's something that we've never had to face as a family. I mean, it's tough altogether. They got on General Motors when gas prices went up about building gas guzzlers. So everybody switched to, you know, going green. You know, you got to go green, something energy efficient, fuel efficient. And so then at that point, when I got laid off, I started to look into the windmill industry for alternative energy because that started to take right off. But what I've noticed is gas prices have come down, and that's pretty much fell right off. Bless us, O Lord, for these gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's eat again. My lifestyle is going to be set on the wage that I'm able to make, the things that I'm able to do. And, you know, eventually I'd like to have a family and be able to send my kids to college and, and things like that. It's hard to tell where we're going to end up and what's going to be a decent career. I would like to say that I'd be working for General Motors. That's where I would like to work. It's... It's what I've grew up. That's how I've grown up. That's the majority of my family's worked at General Motors. It's been the blood. It's in the family. You know, it's uh, it's a living.
think that Detroit will rebound. I think it will rise again. Uh, Detroit is a, uh, is a very resilient people. Uh, people came here with great expectations. I believe that many people can look back over their lives and, and, and really honestly say, you know, Detroit was very good to me. And I feel uh, the obligation to be committed to help Detroit to get back to where it needs to be. The rebounding of Detroit. And I don't know about you, but I believe that Detroit will rebound. Amen. As a matter of fact, I believe that it is rebounding. Somebody give God praise for that word of prophecy. So rise from your rest and be blessed. It's a city that has so much character and so much potential uh, that, you know, I really felt like, okay, you know, this city, it has to change. You know, in four years, this city's going to be great. But, you know, the longer I've been here and as what was the auto industry has now collapsed, it's really only gotten worse. tomorrow no have you since we started the land bank since i started this whole approach i've had people who like it and people who don't like it uh, a reaction that i've felt or that i've heard more recently is uh, a reaction to this idea of shrinking the city of intentionally trying to redesign the city to make it a smaller and i think better place this is where um a lot of the criticism was because they, they think that Barack Obama and I somehow sort of hatched a plan to demolish American cities. So this one says, every day the Obama administration gets scarier and scarier. First they take over the financial institutions, then private industries like GM. Now Big Brother is coming to bulldoze your home. What I think is not a valid criticism is that we have to rebuild every neighborhood and we have to somehow recreate the flint of the past. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen no matter what we do and it shouldn't happen. And so I, I reject that criticism that somehow by acknowledging that we should be smaller, that that sounds like defeat. In the U.S., we've had this, you know, antiquated notion of our manifest destiny that will simply go west and get bigger. And that has allowed us, I think, to make the mistakes of forgetting what's left behind. The notion that bigger is better is a fallacy, a false premise. It's not true. It comes from the American westward expansion. Primarily, it's this American obsession with growth and expansion. In the U.S., most American cities have barely 100 years of history. And the, the difficulty is that in many cases, Flint, Detroit, both being prime examples, we've had one period of growth followed by one period of decline. And we can't see far enough to realize that that's not the birth, life, and death of a city, but it's just a cycle. I 
I think for a long time, this notion in America that bigger was better was simply an undisputed fact for most people. There was no reason to assume otherwise. People didn't have the long-term vision to think that we could ever run out of space because we had so much of it. People didn't have the vision to see that the smoke coming out of our tailpipes could possibly do us harm. And today, we're paying for that. But at the time, it was simply just this deep love affair that we had with space and this whole notion of the American dream of having your own house with your yard and your own garage and you each have a car. That's all great, but is it necessary? The fact that GM was so out of touch with the rest of the world, I think that's directly connected to the fact that the United States was so out of touch with the rest of the world. As a people, we're always wanting to be the best. And in the 20th century, what we thought was the best was bigger. And we were definitely the best at it. In the 21st century, smarter is going to be better. If we want to be considered the best at anything, it's going to take a major shift in our mindset. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.